Hello everyone who is here already. You of you who are regulars know already the rules of the game. You should be automatically muted. Otherwise, please mute yourself. If you can, keep on your camera. And you can anytime ask any questions that come to your mind, either in the chat or at the end in the Q&A that will be moderated by Eugen. Thank you for that. And also, as some of you may know, we have a secret backstage after the talk, which will not be recorded on YouTube and where you can dig deeper in any questions that may not have been answered with Katarina before. So with that, I would suggest maybe to not penalize the people who are here already. Let's get started. And then whoever comes later can join the train underway or check it on YouTube. So as you can see from the one and 15 minutes ahead, we have today an exciting talk by Katerina, which will be preceded by a brief interview or brief presentation by Daniel, who is part of the center and who asked me, so that's why I'm telling you he has a minor stutter, which I'm sure you won't notice because his topic is really interesting. So don't get distracted. And this is who we are and where you can learn more. Please visit the website if you haven't done so already. And this, as a small teaser, is what else is going to come up in the next months. So if this is not part of your regular agenda yet, then please put it in there. There are a couple of really, really good presentations in the making. All the recordings will be on our website. So don't hesitate to come back for a refresher, for questions, and also for sharing this with anybody who you think could be interested. And with that, I leave it to Daniel. Joshua, can you start the video? Thanks. Hi, I'm Daniel Putman at the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics, and I'm presenting my paper, Sharing Covariate Risk and Networks, Theory and Evidence. Um, and so the classic story, right, of risk pooling is idiosyncratic, where it's uncorrelated across cluster. And so basically, if I have a good year, I pay you. If I have a bad year, you pay um, However, a lot of the risk that we care about is actually covariate or correlated risks. Things like food price spikes or financial crises, things like natural disasters, and of course, pandemics. Um, and so in this model, I'm basically thinking about people are risk tolerant or risk averse. Um, and then kind of using these two types and thinking about how they would transact covariate risk um, with, uh, within the corpus. And so uh, this, this, uh, this model basically has the risk averse, uh, they shift the risk over to the risk tolerant. Um, and so if these, uh, these risk tolerant people have kind of high but up risky consumption, I'd say a little premium here. Um, and then the risk averse have really smooth um, but 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 lower consumption. Um, and so the uh, the risk tolerant basically acts as, as um, excuse me, mini insurance. Um, and so then to think about this in networks, um, what, what I do is I think about the optimal networks and I think about the worst case networks. And so if you think about this really simple network where we've got a group over here and a group over here, this uh, this case where there's there's other, uh, there's kind of no sort of matching, it's going to be the optimal scenario because it basically means that uh, the risk averse and the risk tolerant people are going to be next to each other in networks and so they can transact this risk. And the opposite is basically all the risk averse people are over here and all the risk tolerant people are over here, right? And so that's going to be the worst case because they're not going to transact the risk of 
Um, and so here's the actual data that I work with. Um, and so this is one of the villages that I work with. And so basically, um, this, uh, this village network is going to have a connection if people, um, right, if they trust each other, and um, it's going to have a connection if they've exchanged gifts and the reciprocal gift. Um, and so uh, then, uh, then I also have risk aversion. Um, and so, right, so you'll see that um, there's other uh, risk loving people, right? So purple, a little risk neutral, kind of teal. Green is kind of uh, the more, these, uh, these like risk tolerant people. And then we have the bright yellow, for example, the risk averse people. Um, and so when we actually take this to data, we see there's a 2.1 percentage point reduction in the probability of matching that's associated with a one standard deviation increase in the absolute difference in risk preferences. So this is, um, it's actually a robust to a lot of different specification choices, uh, you know, putting in covariates, et cetera. Uh, and it's also consistent with, with, uh, with, 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 with some evidence from, from, uh, from previous lab experiments. Um, right. And so we tend to believe the results. Um, and, uh, so, so what this means is basically the losses uh, that are due to a sort of matching kind of matching of people who have risk preferences like yourself are in the order of about maybe five dollars a year. Although these might actually be much larger if, um, right? I think that I think that the estimates of risk preferences might, I think, underestimate the risk aversion uh, that actually um, that is taking place. With um, but still, uh, the networks are pretty well designed for this. Uh, Right, uh, right. Uh, so the worst case scenario is zero, and the best case, right, is 100. There are about actually, um, excuse me, 75 percent of the weight. Um, and so there's uh, there's there's a different way we can look at this, and so not just looking at the network, but kind of looking at larger communities within the network. And when we do this, we actually see um, uh, uh, just I uh, just I uh, just I uh, just I uh, uh, just kind of a great deal of attenuation. Um, in the degree of assorted of matching. Um, and this is kind of an interesting wrinkle because you only need to take a step beyond people's kind of other uh, close networks to kind of see this. Um, and so, uh, so, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so if this says what your appetite, um, I encourage you to look at the paper. Um, so this is going to be, uh, this, uh, this is on my website right now. Um, and I'm currently revising it. And so right, if you have any comments, I would love to hear them. Um, and I'm happy to ask. To, 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 of course, excuse me, answer any questions in the chat. Um, and so just view my references. Great. Cheers. Thank you very much. And with this, we come to Katarina here and live with us. Hi. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see this? Yes. Looking good. Perfect. Good. Well, thank you very much um, for inviting me to give this presentation. I'm going to talk about my paper called Coordination and Sophistication. This is joint work with my co-authors Labi Alawi and Antonio Penta, who are both um, at Universitat Pompeo Fabra, among other affiliations. Now, the talk is structured in the following way. I'm first going to briefly go about the motivation and give you sort of uh, the preview of what the paper is about, and then going to talk quickly about the model. And I will finish with the experimental design and the results. So what is the paper about? Well, essentially, we're starting from the point where we're considering someone who's making a difficult choice. Now, we know that especially in situations that might be novel to that individual, that making this choice is going to require quite a bit of thought and introspection. And this is likely to be true both in non-strategic situations, for example, where you're trying to prove a theorem or you have to make a difficult choice between um, complex options, but it might also be true in strategic settings where you're trying to reason about your opponent, for example, by trying to place yourself in their mind, such as in theories um, of mind. Now, this kind of reasoning is common to quite a diverse range of applications, ranging from computational complexity, inattention, unawareness, and so on. But what is important is that while these are quite different in terms of their applications, they share the following features. 
Reasoning is stepwise. It is cognitively costly in the sense that thinking is hard. But importantly, people may find it worthwhile and this is more likely to be the case as the stakes of the decision are higher. So this is sort of the general framework in which the paper sits. Now the application that we're going to sort of use to look at this in more detail is that of equilibrium coordination. Now, and in particular, we know that understanding how players can achieve equilibrium coordination in isolated interactions has been a long-standing question in game theory. And you might not now say, well, there's a very obvious answer to how equilibrium coordination can be achieved in isolated interactions, which is a story of focal points, right? With the sort of the seminal papers by Schelling and Sutton and so on. But importantly, the idea of having a focal point and this leading to equilibrium coordination in the situation um, relies on an idea of shared culture, right? Different individuals have to agree on what is focal in order to um, then coordinate on this. Okay? And for example, in sort of more recent papers by Ketz and Sandroni and Corthus, they rely on this idea of homophily between um, players um, to sort of generate coordination. Now, what we are interested in in this paper is what happens in those situations where focal points are not available. And as a result, the players are going to need to reason about others' behavior. So they need to sit um, and think about the situation before they can make a choice. Now, in this particular setup, it's not obvious at all how or even whether equilibrium coordination can be achieved at home. What we're going to show in this paper is we're going to use a cost-benefit approach um, to provide a mechanism for coordination in the absence of these focal points. And this cost-benefit approach has been um, axiomatized in a past paper by my co-authors, if you're interested. Um, it's a uh, 2022 JP paper. Now, what we're going to do in this paper is we're going to provide a theory of endogenous coordination, and we're going to provide an experimental test of this particular theory. And we have a leading example um, in the paper, which is the traditional battle of the sexes game. So very standard, we have a two by two setup. A row player can choose top or bottom, column player can choose left or right. They both have an interest in coordinating, but they have different preferences for which equilibrium they coordinate on. Row wants to coordinate on top left, while bottom one, oh, sorry, where column wants to coordinate on bottom right. Now, in this particular setup, we're going to assume that there are two groups of individuals. There are low sophistication individuals, denoted by an L. Importantly, this denotes a high cost of reasoning. So whenever you see an L throughout, this denotes low sophistication. And there's going to be the high sophistication group who has a low cost of reasoning. Now, what we're going to show in the paper is that through our mechanism, if there are sufficiently high payoffs R, then coordination can be achieved endogenously in heterogeneous pairs of a low and a high sophistication individual, but not necessarily in homogeneous groups where someone is paired with someone with the same label. And importantly, we're going to show that the coordination for these heterogeneous pairs obtains on the equilibrium which is most favorable to the low sophistication individual. But we're also going to show that this is specific to the battle of the sexes game. This is not true for all kinds of games. Okay. I'm going to move on to the model. So very briefly, the setup, we're going to have two players. We have two by two games. There's isolated interaction. There's no communication. There's complete information. There's no focal points, or they're not available. And the opponent is going to um, be either homogeneous or heterogeneous with respect to the sophistication, and our players are going to be aware um, of these labels. Okay. Now, in terms of the game, as I said, it's a sort of standard setup with a two-player game. Um, we have the set of actions, capital AI, and we have the payoff function, UI for an individual I, um, standard battle of the sexist game for now. And we're going to assume that for each individual I, the path of reasoning can be explained um, or can be given by a sequence, which depends on 
the conjecture that our player I has about his opponent's action, AJ, at a particular step K. And the path of reasoning also depends on his own best response to that conjecture at a step K. Now, our um, theory, or our um, sort of model, allows for various different kinds of reasoning processes. Among them are deliberation over equilibria. In that case, the belief about the opponent's action is going to be also the best response to the action that our individual I um, wants to take at step K. And it's also um, allows for level K reasoning. Okay, in this case, the conjecture about the opponent's um, action is going to be that uh, he is an, an individual of K minus one. Okay, so at a particular step K, our individual I thinks that his opponent um, is going to behave in the K minus one uh, level way. Now in the level K reasoning, we also need some arbitrary anchor. Let's denote this by AI zero. Um, this is A, um, the anchor of individual I. Um, and then we have sort of uh, the best response um, of our individual to uh, his opponent's um, behavior. Now let's go deeper into the level K. So this is just sort of an example for explaining how the model works. It's not so much um, showing that this is just a story of level K. So essentially we have two situations. We have the case where the anchor of individual I is a natural um, equilibrium, and we have the situation where this is not the case. Now, if it is a natural equilibrium, then we're going to assume that our individual is going to behave according to this for all steps of reasoning K. Okay, so essentially this is as if um, this anchor is focal. And then in this particular situation, coordination is possible only if both of our players share the same anchor. And if that happens, then effectively we're back in the traditional story of focal points and exogenous coordination. So what happens if the anchor is not a, um, a Nash equilibrium? Well, then the actions that are being considered are going to cycle between the two actions. Okay, they're going to think about, okay, if I um, play top, um, then the other one plays to, wants to play le left and so on, and it just becomes sort of a chain of reasoning where it cycles through. And then um, where our, um, the behavior that our individual eye takes is effectively going to depend on where our individual stops reasoning and how he's going to make his choice. And this is the kind of endogenous coordination that we're interested in in the paper. Okay, and how he's going to stop reasoning and how he then subsequently makes a choice, this is going to be sort of what we are talking about in the next slides. Okay, so back to sort of the general case. From, these, from this example, we should see that we're not interested in those cases where it's focal and they stick to a particular kind um, of sort of action profile, but to the situations where sort of uh, the actions that are being considered um, are responsive. And this is what this definition says here. Um, we are considering fully responsive um, actions. Now, how is this defined um, more specifically? Well, a path of reasoning of a particular player I is absorbing for um, a player if there exists some step of reasoning K bar, such that for all steps of reasoning above this, they're not going to change the action um, that they want to take, okay? And then sort of following from this, a path of reasoning is responsive for the player if it is not absorbing. And it is fully responsive if it is responsive for both players. And all that this is saying is that essentially continuing to reason never fails to give you some sort of additional information or some new insight. Okay, so it's sort of continues to be relevant to continue thinking. And this is the kind of setting that we're interested in. Okay. And we also rule out paths that eventually stabilize as opposed to Katz and Sandroni's papers. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the stopping rule, right? I said if we sort of if reasoning continues to matter, then behavior is ultimately going to be determined by where they stop reasoning and by the choice that they subsequently make. So stopping rule is going to determine where they stop to reason. And the way in which this, is, this works is that at each particular step K, 
our player i has a value of reasoning. Let's denote this by vi of k. And he's also um, got a cost of reasoning, the c i k. Okay. Now, sort of quite intuitively, our player i is going to continue to think as long as the value of thinking is larger than the cost. This is quite a simple um, assumption here. And the last step that is uncovered is I's cognitive bound, okay? So in the uh, figure here, we're going to have the steps of reasoning K on the x-axis, and let's assume just for um, to make it simpler that the value function is flat, our cost function is increasing, then in this particular case, our individual is going to stop reasoning um, after four steps. Okay. Now, based on the fact that he's going to stop reasoning there, how is he now going to decide which action to choose? Well, it doesn't just matter where he stops reasoning, it also matters where his opponent is going to stop reasoning. Okay, so it matters what our um, player I thinks about Jay's reasoning. And this is determined about his own beliefs about Jay's cost of reasoning, C I J K, and his assumed value of reasoning, B I J K. Okay. Now our individual I is going to play the action A I, I, um, comma, K I, um, where essentially the step of reasoning that he's going to choose the corresponding action to is determined either by his own um, cognitive bound or by what he believes his opponent's cognitive bound to be. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if we look at the following picture, sorry, pictures, we again have K on the x-axis on the figure on the left here. And we're again assuming um, just for, uh, for ease for this example that the value function is flat and that our individual thinks that the opponent has the same uh, value function as himself. Then his own cognitive bound is again determined by where the cost and the value function intersect. And he now has some beliefs about his opponent's cost. And in this particular um, example, he thinks that his opponent is less sophisticated and has a higher cost of reasoning than himself, and that his opponent's cognitive bound is equal to two. So in response to that, he's going to choose the corresponding best response action at step two. If, however, the same individual, again with a cognitive bound at four, believed that his opponent was more sophisticated than himself, that his opponent has a lower cost of reasoning, then his cognitive bound is going to be binding and he's going to play according um, to step four in this case. Okay, because his reasoning is binding, he can't conceive um, of sort of another step of reasoning. Sabrina, just a quick question, if I may. Uh, maybe you yes. get to that, but so can you tell us more about the process of this belief formation? So what am I using to inform my decision? I mean, maybe I'm over, you know, maybe I'm, I'm always thinking that I'm better than them and my cost is smaller, you know? So, but what are the cues that I'm using to actually form the beliefs about the other person's costs and, and so on? So we don't, in the paper, we don't talk about how the beliefs about the opponent are formed. We give those exogenously. So in the experiment, for example, we let them do sort of cognitive sophistication tests and then we inform them of the resulting labels. But you could imagine that sort of in a real world situation, this is akin to maybe a small company going into a bargaining, bargaining situation with a large company. They know that the others have the better lawyers, the more experience, and sort of this is where these beliefs come from. But we don't sort of uh, generate these beliefs um, endogenously. So just following up a bit, so there's no uncertainty about the value of thinking? It's not like you don't know exactly? Is there uncertainty or not? I didn't... No, there's no uncertainty about the value of reasoning. We're going to pin this down in, I think, three slides or so. Okay. Okay. So we have um, a series of maintained assumptions. The most important of these is that the path of reasoning is fully responsive for all of our individuals. For the experiment, we're going to sort of uh, weaken this a little bit. But essentially, if it's not fully responsive, then there's just not that much uh, to say about behavior in this case. Now, in terms of the cost of reasoning, for each of our um, players' I, we're assuming that not thinking is free. This is just a normalization of the sort of the lowest cost of reasoning. 
then we're assuming that the costs are increasing with each step um, of reasoning k. Now, where does this come from? Well, essentially, the cost of reasoning in the setup comes from trying to figure out what the opponent is doing. And this gets increasingly more difficult. So think about sort of a theory of mind setup where our individual first thinks, okay, this is what I would do. Now, how would my opponent um, react to this? But then how am I going to react to the, uh, this and how is my opponent going to think that I will react and so on. So each step of reasoning is going to increase sort of this, um, what am I thinking that my opponent is thinking that I'm doing and so on. Um, we're also assuming that the costs are finite and we're assuming that the costs are not uniformly bounded. So essentially these two are there to make sure that um, there's some sort of uh, value for which it's, uh, it's worthwhile to reason, um, and also to, um, but also to rule out the possibility that there's some finite, large, but still finite value of reasoning um, that would lead the, re um, the player to sort of reason endlessly. Now, to get to the value function, we're going to make the following assumption about how this uh, value um, of reasoning looks like. Well, it takes a maximum gain formulation, essentially where our individual is going to compare um, or is going to depend on the sort of best response um, at a particular step compared to sort of uh, the value um, of, of sort of not taking the extra step. So essentially you can see what is the maximum gain from thinking one further step? Now, how exactly does this look like? Well, looking back at the two by two um, battle of the sexes game, again, the top and bottom and the left and right actions for our row and our column players respectively. Let's say from the perspective of the row player that the last step of reasoning that they've taken um, at, K, at step K minus one took them to believe that playing action B is the best um, that they, they can do at this particular step. Then what the value function says is that, okay, if they are right, and if they take one further step of reasoning, and this uncovers that they want to maintain playing um, action B, then they would make um, a payoff of one in both situations. If, however, they take the next step of reasoning K, and they uncover that they want to change their action, as a result of taking that next step of reasoning, then they would obtain a value of R while they would otherwise get zero. So then the value um, of taking the additional step um, to get to uh, step K is worth R. If instead our individual had started um, or had stopped at action T um, for the last step of reasoning that they, that they had taken at chi minus one, the value of reasoning would be equal to one. Why is this the case? Well, if they are um, at action T and they, if they take the next step of reasoning K and they don't uncover that they want to change their action, they're going to continue playing R. In both situations, sorry, they are going to continue playing T, which in both situations, at both the K minus one and at K, if they're right, is going to give them R. If, however, at the next step of reasoning, they decide it is the better action to play B instead, they would get a value of one by changing. Okay, so it's sort of a maximum regret um, sort of story, or um, you're considering uh, the opportunity cost of stopping to reason rather than taking the next step. And this is entirely pinned down sort of by uh, the payoffs of the game, and which is the reason why we maintain this assumption. We don't have to be as, restri as restrictive. However, the results are going to be qualitatively similar if we relax this. And this one pins down um, our hands maximally because it doesn't have any degrees of freedom. Okay. Now, in terms of the sophistication, we're assuming that there are two groups of players, the high sophistication individuals. Um, as I said, don't be confused with the notation. The high stands for the high sophistication. So if you see a cost H, this is a low cost, for the high sophistication individual. And for the low sophistication guys, you have the high cost um, for the low sophistication. Now, the assumption that we have is that for any sort of costs lying within these, the high sophistication and the low sophistication cost sets, the cost of a high individual um, 
high sophistication individual is going to be strictly smaller um, than that of a low sophistication guy for all um, steps of reasoning k. Okay, and it's important that there's sort of a sufficient um, difference between um, the costs. This is because if they're too close to each other, we could still get the same depth of reasoning. So to get different depths of reasoning, we require to be um, there to be a sufficient difference between the costs. Okay. In terms of the information, our players only know their own cost of reasoning, and they know the group of their opponent. And they know that if their opponent is in, for example, the high sophistication group, then the, the beliefs about the opponent's um, cost of reasoning is going to be part of that, um, for example, high sophistication set of costs. Okay. Now, is there a question? No, okay, good. Um, now, in terms of the depth of reasoning, so taking everything together, essentially, Let's look at the case first where our row a player um, has uh, sort of stopped at a particular step of reasoning, which brought him to um, play or to want to play um, W1, one for the row player, two for the column player. Um, and sort of having again the setup as beforehand, we have now the actions that they're considering playing on the x-axis. And we again have the increasing cost function, and now we have the value function, um, sort of which corresponds to the form of the value function that I was showing you earlier. So if our individual is at a step of reasoning that has brought him to um, want to play W1, then the sort of value of reasoning of taking the next step is going to be equal to five. Okay, so following the same process as beforehand, um, because this is sort of the, the maximum gain they could get at the next step of reasoning. Now notice that as the payoffs, this was previously R, increases to let's say 12, then the value function is going to shift up and they are likely to take the next step of reasoning, which is then going to bring them to play action B1, okay? So for some sufficiently high value of reasoning, our individual is going to shift from playing W1 to playing B1. Now let's look at what happens if the last step of reasoning had brought them to play action B1 instead. If this is the case, then the value of reasoning of taking the next step of reasoning is going to be equal to one. As this value, this value here increases, this is not going to change. So increasing the payoffs is not going to have an impact if you are currently at, um, at level B1, okay? So notice the asymmetry between sort of these two uh, these two situations. If the player is a W1, then increasing the payoffs is going to shift this individual um, to playing B1. But if they are already at B1, they're quite likely um, to be stuck there and to not want to take the next um, step of reasoning. Okay. Um, to explain this um, in more detail, let's say we have um, our role player and he faces a more sophisticated opponent, then from his um, perspective, his, um, he has a higher cost of reasoning, his opponent has a lower cost of reasoning, and for sufficiently high payoffs R, he's going to play B1. Okay, because his cognitive bound is going to be binding, um, and um, he's going to be shifted towards uh, uh, playing B1. Now, from the perspective of the... Um, player two, who is now facing a less sophisticated opponent, he's going to play according to his beliefs over, over player one, right? And this belief is going to be that his opponent is going to choose B1. Now, for sufficiently high payoffs R, our column player is going to be correct and is going to successfully coordinate with player one by choosing action W2. Okay, so they're going to coordinate um, on this equilibrium. Now, this leads to sort of, yes. Sorry. Yeah, so I mean, is, is this, I mean, a, a simple summary is that the sophistication levels act as a coordination device, right? No, it's not. Just, I'm going to get to that in uh, okay. the next slide. Um, okay. This is why we have uh, different games, which show that it really depends on the structure of the game um, combined with the um, reasoning process. 
Yeah. Um, I yeah. have a question. Um, when you say that each player knows the group to which uh, the opponent uh, uh, belongs, and you gave an example of the set HL, okay? Uh, which is basically, so it can be low or can be high, but if it belongs to that set, do you assess an equal probability or H or L and count this probability in your calculation? Um, so we don't, so we use the label with certainty. So effectively we're saying this, your opponent is someone in the low sophistication group um, and uh, the alternative message is your um, opponent is someone in the high sophistication group. There's no uncertainty at all about which groups these are. Now, this doesn't have to be right. The only thing that matters is that both of the players believe in their relative sophistication and that there's sufficient difference in the sophistication. Well, this is crucial for your result, yeah. actually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, for our sort of uh, formal results um, of the model, under the, our maintained assumptions and importantly with responsive paths, we're going to have some threshold um, of the payoffs such that for all payoffs are above this threshold, our player I is going to stop reasoning at some, um, at some step um, K hat such that he's going to choose action BI at that particular step of reasoning, so this couldn't have found. Then there also exists a threshold such that for all hours above this um, second threshold, our player I is going to think that his opponent J stopped reasoning at some um, positive bound such that he's going to choose BJ. And there exists some third threshold such that for all um, values, so all payoffs are above this threshold, our player I is going to play BI if he thinks that J is at least as sophisticated, so if it's determined by his own cognitive bound. And he's going to play WI if he thinks that um, the other player J is strictly less sophisticated, so he's going to play according to his own beliefs here. So now, this gives rise one me, second, um, yeah, just to... Hold, sorry. <laughs> let me just uh, follow up on Christina's question. So if it only matters... Uh, that the other that you know the group and anybody in the other group is clearly above you or clearly below you then why do you need the group so why don't you just have low or high and um, this is effectively what we have we're doing this to allow a little bit more but you will see in the experiment we have exactly this we just have low and high um because we we don't know what the exact cost is we just need them to believe in this this is just to allow a little bit more flexibility, but effectively, this is you're right, this is all what matters. Thanks. So the results one to three are going to give rise to our key result, which is that of adaptive coordination. And what is adaptive coordination here? Well, if both players agree that our player I is strictly more sophisticated than player J, then there exists a threshold R bar such that for all um, payoffs are above this threshold, our players um, are going to play the profile um, WIBJ, um, which is the Nash equilibrium most favorable um, to player J, so the less sophisticated individual. Okay. Good. Now, you already asked um, a little bit as sort of a flavor of this, which is that, well, maybe this is then just a story about the labels, um, and maybe um, it reminds you of the first mover advantage. But it's a little bit, um, it sounds a little bit as if it's um, that the low sophistication individual commits um, to moving first, and then the best that our higher sophistication individual can do is best respond to that, okay? And in order to check whether that is the case, we're going to look at a game which we call the modified battle of the sexes game. And in this particular game, we're going to show that there is um, a threshold such that um, of the payoffs again, such that the players achieve equi equilibrium coordination on the equilibrium which is most favorable to the high sophistication individual. Okay, so by following exactly the same um, mechanism as beforehand, it's going to bring them to play um, the equilibrium most favorable to our high, um, high individual player. Now, the story that you mentioned was more sort of a focal label explanation, right? I mean, perhaps 
They don't, they can't coordinate on the actions, but maybe they can coordinate on the label, right? Having a high or low label. And in the particular battle of the sexist game, this would be most likely to be that they take the low level as a clue that they should play um, the low label's favorite equilibrium. However, given that in the modified battle of the sexes, we have the opposite prediction, it's quite unlikely that which label is focal should switch between the different games, seeing that they're quite similar. And more importantly, we also have predictions, sort of more subtle predictions that our low sophistication individuals are equally likely to play their favorite equilibrium against both another low or against a high sophistication opponent, while our higher sophistication individuals are going to react to the opponent's label. Okay? And whether this is the case, we're going to see in the um, experimental results. Okay. So how did the experimental design look like? Well, first off, we needed to figure out which groups we could sort the individuals into. And also, as I said, this is a story about beliefs. Um, so it's important that our individuals believe in the ranking. So we first let them play a cognitive sophistication test, which consisted of a muddy faces game, then a version of the mastermind game, as well as a centipede game. And we had used um, these games in previous papers um, to create sort of these um, endogenous rankings. After they had played this, they were informed of their own label as being high or low. We also had a group that was moderate in terms of performance. This was in order to, um, for us to credibly tell them that there was sufficient difference um, in their performance. Okay, because recall that it's quite important that they believe that there is um, quite a bit um, of difference in their sophistication levels. Now, after they have been informed of their label, they play the battle of the sexist game, modified battle of the sexist game, the stack hunt game, and an asymmetric matching pennies game. Of each of these, they play four versions, a low payoff version against someone from their own label, low payoff against someone from another label, and then both of these against um, for a high payoff version. Now, after they have completed those games, they play an additional cognitive sophistication test. This is in order to assess um, whether our cognitive um, sophistication test um, was um, working here. And so for a third of the subjects, they play the Raven's um, progressive matrices um, test instead. Um, and in order to be able to compare them, they then either, so if they play our test, they then play the advanced progressive matrices at the end and vice versa. Okay. So the main experiment only uses the high and the low sophistication individuals to generate the um, sufficient perceived distance between them. They play the battle of the sexist game with um, the setup that we had beforehand with the payoff of um, 50 here, and then R um, could be 51 in the low payoff version and 70 in the high payoff version. And then they played a version of the modified Battle of the Sexist game. It looks a little bit different because we wanted it to be sufficiently distinct when they look at it to realize that it's a different game. And also in order to not have any negative payoffs in here, but it works in exactly the same way um, as the modified Battle of the Sexist game I was showing earlier. Now, at the end of the experiment, the subjects were asked whether they believed that the performance in the test was correlated to the success in the games. And we can show that the more they believed in the test, the more consistent the results are with the model, um, which uh, is very reassuring. Um, then they also played a short cognitive reflection test, as well as a hypothetical acyclical 1120 game, as well as the alternative cognitive test. And in terms of the logistics, we had 181 subjects. The experiment took um, just under two hours. They were paid for every fourth game, so for one out of each type of the game. And on average, they obtained um, 21 euros 15. Okay. Now, in order to link the theory to the experiment, we have uh, the following three identification assumptions. First of all, the subjects of the same label commonly agree that they are equally sophisticated. 
Subjects of different labels commonly agree that the high sophistication individuals are strictly more sophisticated than the low sophistication um, subjects, and that the paths of reasoning are responsive for at least some individuals. Any questions about this? Okay, very good. Yes. Georgie has one, yeah. You muted, Georgie. So you still you have to repeat this, right? You have you repeat the play, right? Although yes. it's a one-shot logic, you know. I mean, um, so I guess learning is also important for this, no? It's learning in to play it. Well, so they change the opponent every time, and there's no feedback, so they have no idea no. whether what they did was was good or bad. So in that sense. Learning shouldn't be play um, a role. Oh, so then then you repeat it to get more data, or you you don't want them to learn, or no? So I mean, we want to have isolated interactions, so we don't want to have learning. The reason why we repeat it is to have different versions. So we want to see what happens if they play against someone from their own label um, versus what happens if they play against someone from the other label. So we need those two. And we want also we want to see whether as the payoffs increases. Um, we observe the shift um, in, for example, going from uh, the W1 to the X1 um, that the model predicts. But for that, we then need everything with the low payoff and the high payoff version. This is why we have the four versions of each game. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good. So in terms of the results, um, our first prediction is that the beliefs should matter for the high sophistication individuals. And what this says here is the percentage of high sophistication individuals who play their preferred action, X1, in the battle of the sexes against another um, sophistication, uh, sorry, another player from their own sophistication level. And we can see that 54% um, of individuals play their own preferred action. Now, if they play against someone from the low um, label, this drops down to 35%. And this is significant at the 1% level. Now, as the payoffs increase, we expect to see the same thing, which is that more subjects, so more high individuals play um, their own preferred action when they are matched with someone from their own label because they play according to their own cognitive bound um, compared to when they play against someone from the low label because there they play according to their beliefs. Um, and this should be that their um, opponent is more likely to play X2, so their best response is to play Y1. Now for the low sophistication um, individuals, we expect there not to be any difference because they're going to be playing according to their cognitive bound, no matter whether they're matched with someone from their own um, label or with someone from the high label. And indeed we see there's a slight difference when they play against uh, the high sophistication individuals this is not statistically significant. And for the high payoff version of the Battle of the Sexes game, we see that the exact same percentage plays um, X, no matter who the opponent is. So these are um, all consistent with our theory. Now, in terms of the payoff effect, the high sophistication individuals, we predict that a lower percentage of individuals plays X um, if they are matched, um, sorry, in the low payoff version of the game compared to the high payoff version of the game. Um, why is that the case? Well, as the payoffs increase, at least for some fraction um, of the individuals, it's likely to bring them above the threshold value, which shifts them towards playing um, X when uh, they're playing according to their own um, cognitive bound. However, when they play against someone from the low sophistication group, the cognitive bound shouldn't matter anymore because they're playing according to their beliefs. So then they're going to play um, X1, sorry, X um, more for the low um, payoff version than against um, the high payoff version because as the payoffs increase, more of the low sophistication individual uh, opponents should shift towards playing X, which should mean that the high sophistication guys should shift towards playing Y in response to this. And for both of these um, predictions, we find um, that they hold. 
um, the first one significantly, the second one um, it does in terms of uh, the numbers, but it's not significant. And the second prediction for the low sophistication individuals is, well, they're playing against um, according to their cognitive bound in both cases. As the payoff increases, the cognitive bound for the some individuals might um, shift such that some of them switch towards playing X, so that more higher percentage of low sophistication guys should play X as the payoffs increase. And we find that this is the case in the experiment, and this is significant. Now for the, um, um, for the other sort of opponent, as they are playing according to their cognitive bound, um, no matter whether they're playing against a low or high sophistication individual, um, the same um, prediction holds here. Um, and we find that there's a slight difference, but this is not um, statistically significant. Okay. Now, in terms of the sort of uh, um, size of the belief effect, we expect this to be larger in the um, high payoff um, version of the game rather compared to the low um, payoff game. This is for the high individual guys, um, and we find indeed that this is the case. Now, for our low sophistication individuals, as I said, the belief effect shouldn't matter, so we predict that there isn't a difference in, um, in the size of the belief effect, um, irrespective of whether um, the payoffs are high or whether they're low. And again, we find um, that there is no statistically um, significant difference here. So this is consistent with our theory. Now, looking at the reverse strategic advantage game, um, which we use in order to test um, whether the first mover advantage theory holds or not. If the first mover theory holds and it's in line with the um, battle of the sexes, then we would predict that more um, of our high sophistication um, guys concede um, against um, the uh, low sophistication people, no matter whether we are in the reverse strategic advantage or whether we are in the battle of the sexes game. But our model predicts that more individuals um, should um, play their own preferred action against the low sophistication opponents or high sophistication guy in the reverse strategic advantage. And we find that this is indeed the case, although it's not statistically significant. And then for the low sophistication guys, we again predict that there shouldn't be a difference. Um, while the first move advantage um, model would say that um, our uh, low sophistication guys anticipate that the high sophistication guys um, concede against them so that um, more of them should play X when they play against a high sophistication individual. So taken together, these results um, are quite consistent um, with uh, what our model predicts. Now, finally, considering coordination in this particular setup, let's um, look at the um, sort of perspective of a role player. And let's first look at a high sophistication role player then our model predicts that coordination is more likely to occur on the equilibrium, which is more favorable to the opponent, the low sophistication opponent. And we can see that if they are matched with someone from the high sophistication group, so in the homogeneous setting, only 19% um, play a coordinator on this equilibrium, for the low payoff, and 24% for the high payoff. However, as their opponent changes to someone from the low sophistication group, this increases to nearly 41% who coordinate on this equilibrium, which is quite a dramatic shift. And also for the high payoff version, this is over 38% who coordinate on this. Now, how does this look like if we um, look at the perspective of a low sophistication role player? But from their perspective, the model predicts that they're going to be more likely to coordinate on their own preferred equilibrium um, if they are matched with someone um, from the other labels, so the high sophistication label. If they're matched with someone from their own label, then this is 28% to coordinate on this equilibrium um, for the low payoff and 34% for the high payoff version. And this increases to 41% against the high sophistication opponent 
and um, just over 38% um, for the high payoff. So again, quite a marked um, increase in the level of coordination and on the coordination on this particular equilibrium um, that the theory predicts. Okay. So to finish off, um, what the paper does is, is it provides new insights on coordination and in particular, it shows that coordination is favored by heterogeneous matching over the cost of reasoning, as opposed to sort of the more traditional um, idea of exogenous um, coordination, when, um, which is more likely to occur when we have homogeneous matching. Um, and we show that the strategic advantage is determined endogenously, and it depends on the payoff structure of the game, such that the coordination um, favors the low sophistication player in the battle of the sexes, but not in the modified battle of the sexes game. And we show that our experimental results are consistent with these predictions, and further that the results of the modified battle of the sexes game reject alternative mechanisms, such as the first move advantage, um, as well as label focality um, as an alternative explanation. And we show in the paper that the additional games, um, the stack hunt and the asymmetric matching pennies game are also consistent um, with the model. Well, thank you very much. This is it um, from my side. Um, um, I'd welcome any questions that you might have. Great, Katarina. Thank you. That was great. Um, so let's see. So we had a yeah, Jory. Jory, you want to go ahead? Yes, I, it's just following up on. So in a sense, the high le, low sophistication does act as a coordination device. The only thing is, it's not so simple. It's not like L go, moves first always, and the other. Right? So it 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 acts as a coordination device in a complex in a complex way, right? But so it acts as a coordination device through the beliefs about the opponents reasoning process okay and that's yeah so and then i mean another thing which is goes beyond the model but so if i'm high sophistication would i have an incentive to uh say to appear as low sophistication so in the battle of the sexes game if you can credibly claim that you are the low sophistication individual and the other one believes that you are the low sophistication individual then yes, um, but it depends on the structure of the game that you're considering um, playing. Okay. okay, so I mean, because something that is kind of special is you, you model a, a one-shot uh, encounter, so you just encounter somebody you don't know anything about, but you do know that it's L-O-H. <laughs> And and that seems, and you also know it very, you're very sure about it, instead of saying, maybe I don't know, and maybe I, he's faking, right, maybe, or she's faking, he, she is actually, uh, she says she's L, but actually she's H, because that's the other way, right, I mean, that's, I, I didn't give this example, because it's harder, but it could be that you're H, but you say you're L, so that you gain right but okay yeah i mean so the sort of example um that you might uh, want to think about is small corporation you know um that is bargaining with a big corporation or um you know someone with a high um, educational um background with someone who does not have that kind of background so these are sort of features that you might know about each other and which might form your beliefs about how sophisticated they are which might not be true but which are quite likely to hold in terms of stereotypes about each other's uh, sophistication level. Okay, thanks. So maybe in the meantime, maybe circling back at the to my original question. So about with respect to belief formation, right? So is there something in the works or something in terms of next steps? Because I feel like that's that's interesting. That mimics real life quite a bit, right? So how do we how do we form those beliefs about the others, right? So is there anything that you can, you know, point to that sort of would be an extension maybe of sorts to your work or? So we haven't, we haven't considered um, this part um, of the beliefs. Um, we have, sort of in all the papers, we have exogenously imposed um, that people are aware um, of uh, 
of their own label and their opponent's label. Um, so, so in that sense, I think this is a very interesting um, extension, but one that we haven't considered yet. Because the way I'm thinking about this is, um, so we had uh, recently uh, Sendil and Mula Nathan, he was giving a talk here and he is doing a lot of work, you know, the algorithmic sort of bias type of research. Um, and of course, in a way, the goal of that research is to see like how much information is there like in a face, right? And I mean, other people have also studied this, right? I mean, there's the Gnizi and Sarah Garcia paper, right? About can you spot lying just by looking at people's faces, like all of that. And so I feel like your project could, could be part of that too, is sort of, you know, like how much do we learn by even just like, even just looking at them, but maybe even barely interacting with them and how that helps us to form beliefs that will then affect the type of coordination that you sort of investigating here, right? So in a way you precede that by a step of interaction of sorts, right? And in, then, yeah, know, no, uh, definitely, it would be very interesting yeah. just looking to look into that. Great, do I have any other questions? So Christina had to step out a little bit earlier. She may or may not have had uh, a question. She said she will follow up with you. Um, do we have anybody else? Great, if not, um, then Cornelia, I'll yield back to you and then. Yeah, thank you. Since there are no more questions, even in the normal um, round, I guess, is there interest for anybody who wants to dig into some questions any further? Otherwise, we conclude here, we liberate Katarina and everybody. And yeah, thank you so much for coming everyone. <laughs>